It's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, to the Premier, every one of us in this legislature knows someone who doesn't have a family doctor. There are over 800,000 Ontarians without one. The government's response has been to cut clinical care funding by more than 7 per cent over the last three years. We all know someone battling addiction, whether you know it or not, and the government slashed addiction services funding by 50 per cent. The government ignores the struggle of these at-risk patients. The, the risks they face every day. Mr. Speaker, these cuts target each and every community in Ontario. Will the government reconsider their health cuts before the end of the year? So, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to comment uh, on the specifics, but I, I also know that the Leader of the Opposition understands full well that health care funding in this province goes up every year. Year over year, funding has increased, Mr. Speaker. He knows full well that uh, the needs are expanding in the province, and that's why funding for health care continues to go up. Mr. Speaker, there are thousands more doctors in this province, thousands more nurses in this province since we've been in office, Mr. Speaker, because we understand how critical it is that people have the care that they need where they need it. Uh, I think, Mr. Speaker, it's uh, more than 90 per cent of people in this province have access to, uh, to a, a primary care practitioner, Mr. Speaker, and we've made a commitment that, uh, that by 2018, Answer. everyone in the province will have access to a primary care practitioner. That's one of the reasons, Mr. Speaker, that funding continues to go up. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Premier, if you take into consideration federal transfers, the health budget actually went down. These cuts are having real effects. In Kingston, five family doctors Order were unable to join a local practice group. They were turned away from practicing. In Peterborough, a family doctor was unable to join a family health group, leaving 750 patients stranded. In Oakville, a family doctor closed their practice, leaving 900 patients without a doctor to see. In Richmond Hill, five doctors abandoned their plans to open practices, leaving 5,000 patients waiting to find a new doctor. The government should be ashamed. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is, did the members from Kingston, Peterborough, Oakville, Richmond Hill stand up and speak for their patients, or did you ignore them? What is really happening? Well, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the Leader of the Opposition, what did he say as a member from Ontario of the federal, legislature, federal House of Commons? What did he say when Stephen Harper cut the federal transfer by $8 billion, the health transfer to Ontario? What did the Leader of the Opposition say at that point, Mr. Speaker? Because Finish, please. Tell the Leader of the Opposition that this has been a conversation of acute interest at the Premier's table, Mr. Speaker, and we are, uh, we are going to be putting health care on the agenda in our conversations with the new Prime Minister, because when that $8 billion was cut from transfers, federal transfers to Ontario, Mr. Speaker, I didn't hear Answer. any voice from the Leader of the Opposition. I didn't hear any concern from the Leader of, of the Opposition, who Thank was you. an Ontario member in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. Final supplement. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, while federal transfers continued to increase, you cut $54 million. Those are the cold, hard facts. Right here in Toronto, a blood monitoring clinic couldn't stay open because of the government's last round of cuts. Those patients have seen dramatic delays in discharges, and it has resulted in longer wait times. In Ottawa, two dermatology resident students left the province rather than set up shop here when wait times are already far too long. In Ajax, 12 doctors aren't able to offer flu vaccination clinics, affecting 8,000 patients. Again, all in Liberal writings. I can tell you countless stories from our side of the aisle as well. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has either silenced her own members or ignored them. Why won't anyone on this side of the aisle stand up to the Question. Premier and to say that the cuts to health care in your writings is wrong? Order. Order. You won't know when. Uh, just to remind the member to speak to the chair. Thank you.
Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the leader of the uh, official opposition was a member of the federal government at a time when they cut off refugee health care to Shame deserving and vulnerable Shame people in this Shame country, Mr. Speaker. And I know he was a part of the federal party, the federal Conservative Party, when they decided to eliminate any health accord with the provinces. Yep. And I'm so pleased that the new, the, the new Liberal government in Ottawa has made that commitment and to negotiate and partner with the provinces and the territories to actually create a health accord that has been absent for nearly the last decade, Mr. Speaker. So, and the truth is, and the member opposite knows this, I know that the Progressive Conservative Party does have a history of being challenged when it comes to the numbers, but he knows that the figures that he's using are estimates if he was to actually look at the actual numbers that are available. The member from the Fee and Carlson come to order. Continue to increase the health care budget year after year after year, and we'll continue to do Thank that, you. Mr. Speaker. Good question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, the Globe and Mail headline was Ontario long-term climate st strategy short on details. The National Post headline reads, Ontario leaves many questions unanswered in new climate change strategy. The Post online said, Ontario climate plan shy on details. CBC headline, expect climate change plan details in new year. Mr. Speaker, was, was this just another example of photo op environmentalism, or do you actually plan to do something before you jet off for Paris? Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just say to the, uh, the uh, Leader of the Opposition that we have a plan. They had no plan. They don't talk about plan. And in fact, the member sitting behind him, Mr. Speaker, doesn't think that we should implement the plan that we have announced. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to tolerate shouting people down. I would suggest that the Leader of the Opposition read the stories underneath those headlines, Mr. Speaker, and he will see that the outline that we have laid out is exactly what we said we were going to do, Mr. Speaker. We made it very clear that we would bring out a strategy at this point, that we will be bringing out a, a detailed five-year plan in the new year, Mr. Speaker, and that is consistent with the work that we've already done in terms of shutting down the coal-fired plants, the work that we are doing right now on the design of the cap-and-trade yes, system. But, Mr. Speaker, there are members in his caucus who don't think we should have a plan at all and think we should scrap what we are doing, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I read those articles and they all said, all those descriptions of your press conference, said it was a news conference without news, a news conference without a plan. We need to do our part to fight climate change. We must leave Ontario a better place for generations to come. Goes both ways. Finish, please. In that spirit, I asked the minister and the premier, as they always said, what's the cost of doing nothing? By looking at the headlines, their climate change strategy did just that. But what I want to know is a reasonable question is, what is the cost of doing something? Mr. Speaker, will the premier release details today or before she leaves for Paris? What is the cost for the average household of your climate change plan, if there is a plan? Well, Mr. Speaker, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad that the leader of the opposition has gotten to the real point of what he wanted to ask, which is that he doesn't think we should do this. His environment critic doesn't think we should do this. They don't think we should have a plan because they are unwilling, Mr. Speaker, to acknowledge that the cost of doing nothing, the cost. Um, I did hear something I didn't like, and if I knew who it was, I'd ask them to withdraw it. And it stops now. Finish, please. Increased insurance costs, Mr. Speaker, the degradation of the environment, costs of food, all of those costs, Mr. Speaker, are costs that we cannot, as, as, a, as the human race, we cannot afford those costs, Mr. No. Speaker. It is, it is imperative that we take action along Answer. with jurisdictions around the world to curb this development, to yeah. decrease our greenhouse gas emissions. That's why Thank we're you. working to put a cap-and-trade system in place, Mr. Speaker, and I know they Thank you. The member from Prince Edward Hastings come to order. Final supplementary. Speaker, again to the Premier, everyone agrees we should fight climate change. Our concern is you had, uh, you had a news conference. It was a photo op. There is no plan. What we're asking for, very simply, is share with us your plan. You know, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Today. 
but I will narrow it down further. From Barry. In British Columbia, the Auditor General ensures that every dollar from the carbon tax goes back to families and businesses Revenue. to help reduce emissions. Mr. Speaker, well, since we are still waiting for the details from the Premier, will she at least commit to us? Will she commit to the Legislature that her cap-and-trade program will have AG oversight and be revenue neutral? You see the please? You see the please? Thank you. Pre the member from Renfrew, Nipsey, and Pembroke, come to order. Climate change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the environment. <laughs> we just finished a five-year plan, which I don't think they've even read, which successfully reduced our emissions by 6 percent and had no negative impact, did not raise any prices, period. Our intention with our next five-year plan is to achieve the same objectives. And, Mr. Speaker, we're the only jurisdiction in North America that has actually closed closed plants and has actually achieved its, its objectives. Save Quebec. Oh, Mr. Speaker, on. the document here is quite detailed. It is more detailed than Alberta's, British Columbia's, or any others. Maybe the Leader of the Opposition should take a basic reading lesson, Mr. Speaker, because it's about grade A English if he can't understand it. And, Mr. Speaker, to answer his question directly, the plans that we are introducing will make life less expensive for Ontarians than in action, and that's been demonstrated. Thank you. New question. The member from Bramley Lee Gormald. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier told Ontarians that learning from other provinces where hydro rates are cheaper and they invest more in conservation is, I quote, trying to drive wedges among the provinces. The Premier ought to know that learning from others isn't wedge politics. The Premier knows it's simply doing the right thing for Ontarians. But why is the Premier so stubborn in refusing to look at other provinces? Is it because she knows that Manitoba, BC, Quebec, provinces with public hydro systems have lower rates and invest more in conservation? Is that why? Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I actually have found that sitting at the table with my colleague premiers across the country has been a very valuable experience Absolutely. for Ontario. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite might know that we have, as a result of those uh, conversations, forged uh, agreements with Quebec on uh, on the uh, exchange of energy in peak and off-peak periods, Mr. Speaker, for uh, for us as a province. Um, we have worked to create. Uh, to write a, a Canadian energy strategy, Mr. Speaker, and there were there were lots of voices across the country who said you'll never get agreement among all of the the provinces and territories because the geography is so different and the uh, the systems are so different. Well, we did get that agreement, Mr. Speaker. We got an agreement. The Canadian energy strategy is a foundational document, and it's it's actually a document that the uh, the new prime Answer. minister has signed on to. And as we go into uh, the Paris summit, Mr. Speaker, it's very much going to inform our uh, position there. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Premier suggested that Ontario had nothing to learn from our neighbouring provinces. When our neighbours invest more in conservation and have lower rates, I think we should be learning from those provinces. Why is the Premier so determined to push ahead with selling off Hydro One when all the evidence shows that it's bad for the environment, it's bad for families who are struggling to make ends meet? It's bad public policy. Minister of Energy will withdraw. Draw, Speaker. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for families who are struggling to make ends meet. It's bad public policy. It's simply bad for Ontarians. Well, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. To the member opposite, you can't have it both ways. If we look across the country, you will find examples where there are private distribution companies, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, you look in this province, and there's a mixed distribution in terms of private and public. So the fact is, it is one of the questions. When we were having our conversations about broadening the ownership of, of Hydro One, I actually said that. I said, let's look across other jurisdictions. Show me what the impact is of having uh, having uh, private some private ownership of uh, of a distribution. Uh, company, Mr. Speaker, and the fact is that 
If it's a well-run company, if the services are met, and that is exactly what we want to have happen with Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, then there is no negative impact. In fact, there can be a positive impact. So I am absolutely determined to learn from other jurisdictions. Answer. I work with my colleague premiers, and I will continue to do that for the benefit of the people of Ontario. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you. Well, we have evidence, Mr. Speaker. We know that in provinces where there's public hydro, the rates are cheaper, and we know that in provinces where there's private hydro, the rates are more expensive. We have the evidence. When electricity bills are cheaper in provinces with public power, we should be learning from them, not insulting them. When provinces with public power invest more in conservation, that's a lesson. When public hydro puts money into infrastructure, that's a lesson. But instead, the Premier is committed to selling off Hydro One and putting the province into a worse financial situation, as told by the FAO. Does the Premier really think that Ontario has nothing to learn from those neighbouring provinces? Well, I think, Mr. Speaker, I've answered that question a number of times in terms of working with my colleague Premiers. I will continue to do that. We are, we are in fact, collaborating to an unprecedented extent with, uh, with provinces across the country, Mr. Speaker, and I will continue to do that. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, what the member opposite is not talking about is the differences in geography. The reality is there is different geography across this country. There is different water power accessible to yeah. different That's provinces like mr speaker and we all have to operate within which we uh, within which we have to operate within our own geography so mr speaker i will continue to look for absolutely the best deal possible for the people of ontario that's why we're working with quebec mr speaker that's why there are conversations with manitoba but in the interim i want hydro one to be the Answer. best run company that it can be and i also know mr speaker that we must make those investments in infrastructure if we are going to be competitive, not just in the country, but internationally. No question. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. The Liberals, Liberals promised that selling Hydro One would magically fix transit. The fact is, the money brought in by the sale of Hydro One won't come close to delivering real help to families and cities coping with gridlock. In fact, the sell-off of Hydro One Minister has of Economic to Development. do with building transit, and the Premier knows it. TTC riders in Toronto are being asked to pay more for cash fares. City councils across the province are asking for support, yet transit riders everywhere are being asked to pay more for services while services are being cut. Why is the Premier failing commuters? Mr. Speaker, you know, I just have to say the magical thinking is not on this side of the House. The magical thinking is on the other side of the House, in the third party, Mr. Speaker, where somehow all the projects that are needed across the province, the roads, the bridges, the transit systems, that somehow those can all be built without making one tough decision. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that's not the case. So I would say to the, to the, uh, the member opposite, when he goes down the list of projects that we are building, whether it's the Kitchener line, which will be partly electrified and the weekly trips will go from 80 to 250, or the Lakeshore East line, the annual ridership will go from 10 million to 32 million, or the billion dollars for the Hamilton LRT, or the support for Smart Track, which is the single most important Answer. project that the Mayor of Toronto wants to implement. Which one of those would he cut, Mr. Speaking, yeah. Mr. Speaker, because of his magical thinking? Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the Premier knows it and her entire caucus knows that selling up Hydro One is not the solution. There are far better solutions and far more solutions, and it's not the way to do it. The Premier may not realize this. The Premier may not realize this, but people who rely on transit also Order. pay hydro bills. Selling Hydro One off will actually hurt families twice. Once, as they continue to wait for the bus or sit in traffic on their commute, and again, when they finally get home and open up their hydro bills. Does the Premier realize that selling off Hydro One actually hurts families twice? Thank you, Speaker, what hurts 
these families is if they don't have the roads and the bridges and the transit that they need, Mr. Speaker. What hurts Ontarians is if they don't have an excellent company delivering their electricity, Mr. Speaker. And what hurts Ontarians is if they don't have all the facts. And the reality is, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite, when he's doing it, because there's a political campaign that Kitchener he's engaged Water, in right now with his party to, uh, to fear monger among people about what's going to happen because we are investing in infrastructure and we're broadening the ownership of Hydro One. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, he doesn't talk to his constituents and the constituents in ridings around the province about the investments that their municipalities, their communities are going to get because of the decisions that we are taking. We know, Mr. Speaker, that there is not a municipality Answer. in this province that doesn't need infrastructure dollars. We're providing those infrastructure dollars, Mr. Speaker, Thank and you. we're making the tough decisions in order to do that. Mr. Speaker, what we know is the vast majority of Ontarians don't want this government to sell off Hydro One. What we know is the vast majority of municipalities don't want this government to sell off Hydro One. People are stuck in their cars or packed like sardines in transit, and they're looking for some relief. Selling off Hydro One doesn't actually build transit, and according to the FAO, it could raise as little as $1.4 billion. That's all Selling off Hydro One Remember from Newmarket Aurora come to order. Transit, and the Premier knows this, and her entire caucus knows this. TTC is Toronto's second biggest electricity consumer, and the GO electrification is going to mean more electricity consumption for GO Transit. Higher rates are going to have real impacts on these transit providers. Thank you. The member from Essex and the member from Eglinton, Lauren. Lawrence, it's enough. You have one sentence to wrap up, please. Higher rates are going to impact transit providers, and that means higher fares. Will the Premier stop the sell-off before Thank she you. does any more damage to this province? Premier. Minister of Transportation. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member, of course, for his question. Speaker, this very same debate and discussion has come up several times the from Hamilton Mountain. over the last couple of weeks. And it's interesting, again, that the deputy leader of the NDP would ask us or would talk about what's on the minds of our caucus on this side of the House. I said this last week, Speaker, what's on our minds is making sure that we build the province up. What I think is important, though, Speaker, is that the leader of the NDP and the deputy leader of the NDP have a conversation with backbenchers on that side of the House, Speaker, because every single one of the NDP caucus colleagues that he has has a specific request or a desire to see infrastructure projects occur in each of their ridings, whether we're talking about London or Toronto or Essex or Niagara Falls, Speaker, or the North, four-laning highways, to building chair, transit please. in every single region of the province, Speaker. Why won't you level with the people in your own? Questions and answers are directed to the chair. And, and if it continues with anybody, I'll cut you off. Now that you've had your say, the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is second time. New question. Member from Nipissing. Uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today, the government will present its uh, fall economic statement. I'll be uh, 11 days late. <laughs> Thankfully, the financial accountability officer uh, already gave us some insight into the state of Ontario's finances. He told us of the province's deteriorating economic performance, slower GDP, and weaker labour market outcomes. What he said was the government continues to miss their lofty revenue forecasts, but continues to spend the money they didn't take in. We were told the only way to right the ship is to lower the growth outlook to 3 per cent and spend accordingly. The Globe and Mail concurred, going so far as to suggest the government is living in a fiscal fantasy land. Speaker, my question is, will we finally see the truth about the state question. of our finances in Ontario. Thank you, Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, um, let me just let me just go through the realities that uh, that we're.
dealing with, Mr. Speaker. Year over year, we have uh, beaten our deficit targets, Mr. Speaker, and the financial accountability officer's report said that we're on track to beat our targets again this year. So that's exactly what the FEO has said. And Mr. Speaker, we're doing that because of the plan that we have. Our plan is to build Ontario up, including investing in people's talent and skills, including the infrastructure investments that we were just talking about in the previous question, including uh, fostering a dynamic business climate and working with businesses so that they can expand, so that they can become exporters, Mr. Speaker, and including creating a secure retirement pension plan. That's the, those are the four pillars of our plan, Mr. Speaker. We're unlocking the value of assets, Mr. Speaker, so that we can make that investment of over $130 billion uh, for roads and bridges and transit and hospitals. And yes, That'll support 110,000 jobs a year, Mr. Speaker. And since the recession, Ontario has created more than 500,000 jobs, 559,600 to be exact, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Those are the Thank fundamentals you. that we'll be talking about in the financial Supplementary. Back to, uh, back to the Premier. I question whether the fall economic statement will discuss the facts the government attempted to bear in order to lower their deficit this year. On page 162 of a 167-page finance bill, there's one line, Speaker, that tells us exactly what the government has been up to all along. Schedule 22, Section 7, Item 1, authorizes the government to use the Trillium Trust money to fund, quote, or reimburse, quote, the Crown for the construction of infrastructure. So exactly what we've been saying all along, Speaker, is now laid bare by their own document. The proceeds from the sale of Hydro One are not to fund transit. They're, quote, to reimburse the government for money that was already budgeted. Yes, uh, Speaker, will the Premier now confirm that this been, has been a transit sham all along? <laughs> No, Mr. Speaker, we've been, uh, we've been clear about our plan to use the Trillium, Trillium Trust to build key vital infrastructure uh, projects, Mr. Speaker, transportation projects, Mr. Speaker. That is what we are going to do with that money. The money is in the Trillium Trust and it is going to go to build those projects, Mr. Speaker. And I think that actually the member opposite knows that because he, he understands that there are jurisdictions all over the province, including in northeastern Ontario, that need those infrastructure investments. But let me just talk about uh, the track that we're on, Mr. Speaker. Ontario's unemployment at 6.8 percent is under the national unemployment rate of uh, 7 percent, Mr. Speaker. According to the Conference Board of Canada, Ontario is on track to grow about 2 percent this year, outpacing the projected 1.1 percent GDP increase for the country, yes, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is the first in North America for foreign direct Remember investment from for the second year in a row, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is Thank we are you. on track. We're going to stay on track, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Under Bill 109 that the government is about to ram through, health care workers will no longer have the democratic right to choose the union that represents them in the case of a health sector merger. Under this legislation, if 60 per cent of health care workers are in one union, 100 per cent of workers will lose their right to choose the union that represents them in a merger. In a memo prepared by the Ministry of Health obtained through Freedom of Information, it clearly states that, quote, unquote, no broad-based consultation was done before this section of the bill was tabled wow. and cites consultation with only one stakeholder. Speaker, why were there no broad-based consultations done before the government decided to strip away Question. health sector workers' fundamental right to a democratic vote to select the union they wish to represent them in a merger? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. The Public Sector Labor Relations Transition Act provides a framework to resolve a number of labor relations issues when there's a restructuring in the broader public service. When there's an amalgamation of a hospital, a school, or a town, or a city, two unions have to amalgamate, perhaps in that circumstance, where one union has a large majority, what has been suggested and proposed in the legislation that this legislation, if passed, 
will we'll say we don't have a vote, it goes to the largest sector, to the people that represent the most. There's a difference of opinion within the Labour movement, Speaker, I'll admit to that. Some unions think it's a good idea, some unions have concerns with it. The bill is at committee, it's at the Social Policy Committee. I understand that each and every Social Justice Committee, each and every one of those, uh, yes, those stakeholders are bringing their concerns forward to the committee. I look forward to the committee work on this, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. In fact, on what appears to be the government's very first piece of its massive health transformation plan, they admit they've done no broad consultations. And in the memo that we obtained through uh, FOI from the Ministry of Health, they admit that, quote unquote, the ministry has admitted this issue is not even a problem. And yet the government is stripping health care workers of their most basic democratic right, the right to choose. Speaker, will the Premier tell hundreds of thousands of health care workers in this province why it's willing to actually strip away their rights without even having done consultation for something the government admits isn't even a problem? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again to the member. As I said, there's a variety of opinions on this, and those variety of opinions come from within the Labour movement itself, Speaker. Some people have suggested that the amendments that are being put forward would reduce the potential for delay and the, disrus uh, the disruption that's often associated with these votes. It would remove the large costs associated with it and will contribute to more harmonious labour relations. Others have a different opinion, Speaker. I respect those opinions in the public venue in a very transparent way. This morning, this afternoon, those, uh, those stakeholders are bringing forward their concerns, Speaker. They're addressing the committee on this issue, and I suspect the committee uh, will give this true, uh, good and true deliberation and will bring forward its best amendments if they are needed, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Newmarket, Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Oh. As every member in this House is aware, the Pan Parapan uh, Am Games hosted here in Ontario were the largest and most successful in the history of the Games. The Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport has previously addressed the members in this House about the success of the Pan Parapan Am Games. Many suggested that no one would buy tickets to the Games, Mr. Speaker. Fans bought 1.2 million tickets to the Games. Many suggested that no one would cheer for the Games, Mr. Speaker. In fact, more than 1.4 million people attended the Pan Parapan Am wow. celebrations. Wow. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians are proud of the success of these Games. Through you to the Minister, I'm interested in hearing more about the legacy of the Pan Parapan Am Question. Games, and I'm interested in learning how the legacy has benefited amateur sport in Ontario. Thank you, Minister. Tourism, Culture, Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from uh, Newmarket, Aurora. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that not only did we host the largest and most successful games in the history of this country, we did it on time and on budget. Yeah. Wow. Mr. Speaker, because of that success, Ontarians have been left with a strong legacy of sports, which will be felt for many years to come. Ontario demonstrated that we can increase our athlete success rates by winning the most medals of any Pan Am Para Pan Am Games. Ontario proved that it could be inclusive when we held the most accessible games. And Mr. Speaker, on Thursday, I was at Ryerson University and announced the Ontario's government to build a new plan to increase the success of our athletes in Ontario by announcing a sports strategy called Game On. Good. Mr. Speaker, this is the first the strategy, from Hamilton sports East strategy in Ontario in over 20 years. By leveraging what we from the games, Right after I mentioned, he decides to do it again. So just being lenient because of Wednesday. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, by leveraging what we learned from the Games, Answer. we will bring forward more change. The Game On plan for Ontario represents another long-lasting legacy out of the Pan Am Para Pan Am thank Games you. to benefit Ontario. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. I'm happy to see the minister is using the momentum of the games and to promote uh, to promote healthier, fitter Ontarians. It's well understood that sport creates positive and lasting benefits 
for health and wellness. Sure we know that physical activity contributes to healthier body weight, better cardiovascular fitness for our youth, and that physical activity can help to prevent chronic diseases later in life, like heart disease or cancer. Right. While we know of the benefits of physical activity, Mr. Speaker, we also are aware that there exists a gender gap in sport, one that widens with age. For every adult female engaging in sport, there are two males. Mr. Speaker, as an MPP and as a father of two grown daughters, what are we doing to address this gender gap, and what is our government doing to build up amateur sport? Very good question. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the member. Mr. Speaker, our sports plan focuses on three uh, key areas participation, development, and excellence. Mr. Speaker, we know that in different parts of Ontario, depending on where you live and family income, there are barriers to achievement in sport. We also know that participation uh, by women and girls in sport is half the participation level of that of men. With the help of uh, an advisory panel um, this year, Mr. Speaker, we're going to look for uh, new ways to advance uh, athleticism and sport uh, for women and girls uh, in Ontario by increasing the amount of role models that exist. Mr. Speaker, in the last Winter Games held out in BC, only 11 of the 108 coaches were female. But we also know, in contrast to that, Mr. Speaker, of 400 female executives that were surveyed, 97% participated in sport. So it's my hope, Mr. Speaker, that we can take what we've learned from these games and continue to advance sport in Ontario for everyone. Thank you. Question, the member from Wellington Houghton Hills. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development. The passage of Bill C-40 to establish the Rouge National Urban Park this past January was a great day for Canada in creating the largest urban park in the world, some 20,000 acres. However, this minister threw the entire project into jeopardy by reneging on an agreement signed January 2013 to transfer provincial land to the federal government to create the new park. While the minister cited inadequate environmental protection as the government's rationale for going back on its word, a, a fundraising email sent out by the minister made it clear that the government's motivation was purely partisan. They made up an excuse because they didn't want the Harper government to get credit for the new park prior to the next election. It's that simple. Now that there's a new government in Ottawa, will the minister commit to stop holding up the Rouge National Urban Park and agree to transfer the land? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I was planting trees in the Rouge Valley before I even knew what partisan politics was about. Yes. Uh, when it comes to the Rouge Valley, I and my colleagues from Scarborough and all of us on this side of the House recognize that we have a responsibility, Absolutely. Mr. Speaker. Nothing to do with partisan politics. It's to do with our responsibility to the next generation to ensure that we pass on this gem of an ecosystem of a park to that generation. The government that you spoke about, the Harper government, didn't take that responsibility seriously. Thank goodness, Mr. Speaker, the new Prime Minister and the new government does, and we're looking forward to working with them to put in place a real national park for the Rouge that's going to ensure it has the protections that we have in place today, or maybe the enhanced protections, and I'm looking forward to working with that new government to get that done. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it's absolutely ludicrous for the government to claim that Parks Canada does not provide uh, some of the highest standards of forest protection and management, as the minister has done in the past. The Provincial Environmental Commissioner recently said that the government, and I quote from her report, lack of dedicated funding makes it nearly impossible to protect new parcels of environmentally sensitive land, end quote. The former CEO of Parks Canada, Alan Latorell went as far as to say, and again I quote, any individual or organization that directly or indirectly implies that the federal legislation for Rouge National Urban Park does not meet the standards of the current provincial legislation for Rouge, Rouge lands is misleading the public, end quote, Mr. Speaker. The member will withdraw because you cannot say indirectly what you can say directly. This government has held up the Rouge National Urban Park for far too long. Will the minister listen to the experts, submit comments on the Rouge National Urban Park Management Question. Plan, and transfer the lands he committed to do in 2013? The member from Renfrew-Nipissing, Pembroke, is warned. 
Mr. Speaker, it is this government, Mr. Speaker, that's worked so hard over the last 10 years to ensure that the, the policies are in place to, to ensure that that park is protected for future generations. It is this Liberal uh, government uh, that in the 1980s, Mr. Speaker, under David Peterson, saved those lands in the first place. This is something we feel strongly about, Mr. Absolutely. Speaker. It's nothing to do with partisan politics. And the question from the member was about as partisan as you possibly could get. This is about working together with the federal government to get this done right. We finally have in place, Mr. Speaker, a Minister of the Environment federally and a government that cares about the environment, that's determined, Mr. Sa Speaker, to save this planet, determined to ensure that we Answer. preserve those gems, those ecological gems like the Rouge Valley. We're going to get this done. Thank We're you. going to get this done with Prime Minister Trudeau. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. <clears throat> Just to remind the minister, when I stand, you sit. New question to the member from Ashawa. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. In December of 2013, communities across the province were hit by a massive ice storm. At the time, municipalities were assured that 100 per cent of eligible disaster costs would be reimbursed by the Ontario government. but. Communities across Durham Region have received just a third of that so far, with no timeline in place for the remainder. Residents of Durham want to know that they are not going to be left out in the cold because, Speaker, winter is coming. Really? Will the Premier please explain why she has broken her promise on ice storm funding to the people of Durham Region? Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Speaker, I know that uh, that the, uh, the the devastation that was uh, that was yeah, uh, caused by there. the ice storm, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, um, I was out. I was meeting with people. I was at the warming centres, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I know that it was a real trial for municipalities. I also know, Mr. Speaker, that municipalities are working with the ministry. I know that there has been some money that has flowed. There is more money that uh, I know needs to flow, Mr. Speaker. We will continue that, uh, that cooperation. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, it has been almost two years since communities were hit by the ice storm, and for two years they have been left to wonder when they would see the support they were promised, if at all. Communities like Whitby, Whitby is still waiting for half a million dollars, and my community of Oshawa is waiting for over a million dollars. Does the Premier believe that two years is an appropriate time for these communities to be left in the dark, or does she believe that her government can and should do better? Speaker. Will the Premier commit today to ensuring that communities like Whitby and Oshawa have their promised funding immediately? Yes or no? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, if the member opposite had a conversation with the municipal officials, she would know that claims are being reviewed, Mr. Speaker. She'd know that 28 claims have been fully reviewed and final, final payments have been issued, Mr. Speaker. We've flowed over $62 member million from dollars, Hamilton Mr. Mountain, Speaker, second time. Uh, as of September 2015. And in in addition to help municipalities and conservation authorities, the government has issued interim payments, Mr. Speaker, because one of the issues that I recognized when I was Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing is that often there is an upfront payment that is needed, Mr. Speaker, and we know that, uh, that that is sometimes what is needed. But the claims have to be reviewed. That's why the ministry is working with the municipalities, Mr. Speaker, and we are doing that as quickly as we can. But there are two parties to that review process, Mr. Speaker, and municipalities Answer. Need to be working with ministry and vice versa. Thank you. New question, the member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. Minister, we know that climate change is already impacting our environment and our economy. Extreme weather events create challenges for agricultural production around the world. We also know that. We also know that to find solutions to the challenges we face, we must work together across industries to tackle climate change. Our government has demonstrated and continues to demonstrate its support for farmers in the broader agricultural industry in this mission. In supporting the entire sector through a range of business development programs that include advice, partnership and research, the government is encouraging innovation. Ontario farmers are excellent environmental stewards 
They understand the impact of climate change and are already Question. in practice to fight it, Speaker. Speaker, can the Minister please inform the House about proactive measures Ontario farmers Thank are taking you. to reduce environmental impact? Minister of, Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Northumberland and Quinney West for his question this morning and, and to let the House know that the new thriving question? kale industry is actually centered in his riding in Northumberland and Quinney West. We do know, Mr. Speaker, that there's 52,000 uh, family farms in the province of Ontario. And of those 52,000 uh, family farms, 35,000 of those 52,000 have been involved over the decades in volunteer environmental farm plans contributing to our government's plan for climate change. And through their activity, they've improved the environment by some $353 million of on-farm activity to improve their environment. In February this year, uh, we announced a program, sub uh, $60 million, over four years to improve the water quality, uh, particularly in uh, Lake Erie. Uh, we're looking at ways to contain yes, phosphorus loading and prevent the algae blooms that are now developing uh, in the Lake Erie area. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. It is great to hear that Ontario farmers are engaged in efforts designed to protect the environment. Taking action to modernize, innovate, and adapt allows our industries, including agriculture, to put themselves on a sustainable path forward. Minister, I know our friends from Ontario Pork joined us at Queen's Park yesterday. Speaker, could the minister inform the House on steps the agricultural group is taking to modernize, become more sustainable, and protect the environment? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to recognize the great work that's being done uh, by Ontario Pork. Uh, all sides of the House uh, yesterday uh, had the opportunity uh, to attend uh, their uh, reception, and they just produced a new report talking about social responsibility for the pork industry in the province of Ontario. They've highlighted five key things that they're doing uh, to promote uh, a social responsibility in their industry. They're looking at uh, farm management. They're looking at economic performance. They're looking at environmental stewardship, animal care and food safety, and the relationship with the broader consumer community in the province of Ontario. We all know, on all sides of the House, that farmers are great environmental stewards. I'm proud of the work that they do each and every day, and I want to salute Ontario Pork and Amy Cronin, who, with her husband Mike, uh, just got recognized as the Young Farm Families of Canada uh, just recently in Edmonton, Alberta. A good example of what they're doing in that industry to further the social responsibility in Ontario. New question, a member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Uh, Speaker, in September, Nelson and Kathy Samuel of Gravenhurst went public with an issue that they are facing. While on a vacation to Whitehorse to visit their daughter, Nelson's knee became infected to the point that he had to be transported by medevac to Vancouver for immediate treatment. It saved his life. The Samuels are now facing a bill of $18,400. They are seniors on a fixed income, and this cost would be a big hit on the retirement savings. They even checked with OHIP before making the trip to make sure they had coverage. So, Speaker, to the Minister, what assistance can be provided for Nelson and Kathy in their time of need? Thank you. Minister of Health, Martin Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the member opposite uh, raising this issue. And I think with the permission of the family, I would be interested in learning more about the specific circumstances uh, involved. Uh, a number of members of this legislature have come forward uh, to me directly when such a circumstance does take place. Uh, and uh, thus far, Mr. Speaker, I think that we can say that we've uh, made significant efforts to resolve these specific challenges. But it does point out a, uh, a deficit. I think I would describe it as uh, nationally. Uh, for people, when they are traveling uh, out of province, we have arrangements with all the provinces and territories and the federal government uh, for reimbursement of health care costs. But uh, to date, uh, and this is partly due to because of when these measures were put in place, they haven't uh, accounted for the type of air transport that the member opposite has alluded to uh, with this example. Answer. Thank you, the Minister, for that response, but through the Speaker again to the Minister of Health. Speaker, it has been over a month since the Minister spoke to CTV News about this specific case, and he said, quote, 
We want to make sure that Ontarians, when they travel, that the right to have an expectation that urgent and immediate health care costs will be covered." Close quote. Recently, there was a case in Alberta of an Alberta mother who gave birth prematurely in a Timmins hospital. In the end, she had her emergency travel costs covered jointly by two separate provincial governments. Minister, the clock is ticking as the Samuels bill has now been transferred to an agency for collection. So through the speaker, will the minister commit to help my constituents, Kathy and Nelson, with the massive bill they are now facing? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, the uh, Alberta case that was referenced was, uh, in, in fact, uh, it was covered by the private insurance that the uh, the family in question had. Uh, but that being said, I made the commitment at that time, and we have we have a federal, provincial, territorial meeting coming up in January in British Columbia. That I've asked uh, uh, our partners across the country to uh, to have a, a discussion about this specific issue. I think it's important and timely that we update uh, the reimbursement that. Is available uh, between provinces and territories. Uh, it doesn't, as I mentioned, currently cover uh, air transport of this nature, often individuals, and I would certainly encourage any individual or family traveling outside of the province to have uh, private health insurance to cover all necessities uh, of travel if untoward circumstances do arise. But I have asked for this a specific issue to be put on the Answer. national agenda so that we can address it uh, in a, a comprehensive fashion across the country. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Health. For the fourth year in a row, I rise to ask the Minister of Health for an investigation into the substandard care of Demetria Daskalos, who passed away in a Toronto hospital in February of 2011. The family of Mrs. Daskalos is still waiting answers, and this government has failed to provide them. The daughter of Demetria, Maria Daskalos, is here with us today. I've sent numerous letters to your predecessor, asked questions in the House made statements and presented a petition with over 5,400 signatures. I sent this minister a letter last February 2015. The family still doesn't have answers to the questions that it asked. Mrs. Daskalos was tr treated as a bed blocker, and the hospital was clearly in violation of infection control guidelines when she was housed with other patients with an antibiotic-resistant disease. Will the minister commit to investigation of this case? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, uh, and I appreciate the question. And I, I want to acknowledge uh, um, you here. I'm going to speaking to you directly. Acknowledge your presence here today, and uh, um, my regret uh, that uh, the experience that did happen chair, uh, to you. And I can only imagine the, the devastation, the, the devastation that that it has caused, Mr. Speaker, to the family and loved ones uh, of this individual. Uh, and I would be happy to discuss uh, as well afterwards. Uh, uh, the specifics of this of this case, um, and in the supplementary, I think that uh, I would like to also talk about changes that we put in place that hopefully will provide avenues uh, for individuals and families that do go through these tragic circumstances. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I, I just want to note as well that it was almost a year ago that this government decided not to give the ombudsman power to investigate these kinds of cases. Once again, I ask this minister to launch an investigation into the substandard care of Demetra Descalos, received while a patient at the downtown hospital, and her subsequent death apparently due to the hospital's failure to comply with infection control protocols. Although hospitals are independent corporations directly responsible for the quality of care they provide, the legal accountability and enforcement of breaches in hospital protocol rests squarely with the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, why were infection control guidelines violated? Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, and I'm very proud that uh, what we have done as a government is we've created the office of the patient. Ombudsman, uh, specifically for cases like this where individuals or family members, where an incident occurs for, perhaps in a hospital environment or a long-term care home, if they're unsatisfied with the process that takes place in the hospital, if they don't receive remedy for what they see as a grievance against them, they now have, very shortly, will have an avenue that they can go to, a patient ombudsman within the Ministry of Health, or rather that reports directly to the Minister of Health within Health Quality Ontario, which will work to address their concerns. We do have a responsibility as a government, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that our patients, uh, Ontarians, are provided with the highest quality of care when incidents do occur, when mistakes are made, when procedures 
procedures aren't followed correctly, we have an obligation yes, to make sure that action is taken. That's the commitment that we have, and our patient ombudsman will help us through that process, yes. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the Minister of Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister, you informed the House on Tuesday that Mars West Tower project is currently 84 percent occupied. And this is great news for our province as well as our economy, which stands to benefit from the expertise and innovative research that Mars will attract to Ontario. Speaker, Every day, I receive questions and calls from my local residents, especially the young people in Scarborough Asian Court, inquiring about the West Tower projects. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please update the House on some of the important projects that's coming to Mars West Project? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the member is right. Uh, Mars West Tower is indeed a resounding success. As the member stated, Mr. Speaker, Mars is now 84% leased and it is expected to be fully leased very soon. What's key, Mr. Speaker, is the tenants located in this, in this building are exactly the mix of tenants originally sought. There is a healthy mix of institutional tenants that drive research and innovation with a growing number of private sector tenants that drive innovation, commercialization and job creation, Mr. Speaker, what, what, that, which is exactly what it was all about to begin with. Companies like Facebook, Airbnb, JLabs, League, Synaptive, Kindred, Tekanon, and many more, Mr. Speaker, have picked up leases there and will soon, if they're not already yes, operating in that facility. Mr. Speaker, just two weeks ago, we announced the addition of Autodesk, and I'll have more to say thank about you. that in a minute. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for the answer and for all his hard work on this particular file. Ontario has quickly become one of the strongest jurisdictions for tech innovation. This is truly a proud record, Mr. Speaker. Autodesk is a key part of the innovation and information technology cluster, an exciting addition to Mars. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please provide the House with more information about Autodesk's addition to Mars and what it means to the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member is absolutely right. One of the greatest competitive advantages that Ontario has is our strength in tech innovation. The fact that Ontario now ranks number two to only the Silicon Valley in, the, in ICT, with 19,000 ICT companies innovating in our economy, is absolutely huge. Our world is changing exponentially fast. Technology disruption is occurring in almost every sector of our economy and of our lives. Jurisdictions that want to compete in this new economy need to have strengths in the disruptive technologies like 3D printing, supercomputing, strong tech engineering capacity, and the Internet of any, Everything. Autodesk is a company that is a global leader in all of these disruptive technologies. Mr. Speaker, the sighting of an Autodesk R&D center at Mars will be an incredible asset to our globally competitive innovation capacity in Ontario and make the Toronto Waterloo Super Technology Corridor even stronger. Thank you. Question the member from Halliburton. My question is to the Premier. Last week, I spoke with the leading experts in anti-human trafficking who say that the province is not providing the resources needed for victim services. We have not heard anything uh, specific to anti-human trafficking funding since 2011. The government says they take this crime very seriously, but not seriously enough to initiate a provincial task force. Just days ago, three people were charged with over 20 offences related to human trafficking and sexual assault of a 13-year-old girl. Mr. Speaker, when will the Premier commit to creating a provincial task force and keep women and children safe? Thank you. Thank you. Minister responsible for women's issues. Minister responsible for women's issues and children and youth services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the member, my critic, for this very important question. I, I know we're on the same page in agreement that human trafficking is a deplorable activity uh, that unfortunately overwhelmingly targets women and girls. It's one I take extremely, extremely seriously as the minister responsible for women's issues. We've begun work on this issue, Speaker, by investing over $9 million in the next three years in programs like our language interpreters services, and uh, we want to continue to help 
support uh, victims and provide increased uh, services to them. And uh, funding will also help victims in, in health care, legal and social services. Um, human trafficking, I believe, also, Speaker, is an issue that cuts across uh, ministries. Uh, there's a role to play in what the member is asking about with our uh, Attorney General and our minister responsible Answer. for uh, community uh, correctional services and community safety. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we need programs uh, specifically for human trafficking. It is a, a very uh, separate and specialized uh, crime that is not being uh, taken seriously as, as, as I'd like it to be. Um, I called on the task force because that was the uh, provincial coordinating network um, that is, was encouraged to be set up by uh, all the frontline workers. Um, so I'm not seeing that it's a priority for this government. I appreciate what the minister said, but it's not a priority enough. Um, as I said, the task force would see the coalition of the frontline workers uh, providing specialized victim-centered care. Um, some of the, the victim services, when they are available and we can rescue victims from the abyss of this perverted, insidious crime, they have to actually Google Question. Uh, human trafficking. I mean, I just want to clarify that the services aren't there. So I just want a simple yes or no answer, Mr. Speaker. Thank Will you. the government finally implement Thank you. the uh, task force? Thank you. The Minister of uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services. No such thing as thank you. Yes thank no. you very much, uh, Speaker. First, I want to I want to echo what the the, the minister responsible for women's issue uh, said that this is uh, human trafficking or sexual trafficking is a deplorable uh, activity, and we all have to collectively work together with our partners out in the community to stop this practice. This is an uh, issue, Speaker, that has been very actively being worked on uh, through the Violence Against Women Roundtable. Just yesterday, there was a special meeting that was held where this issue was referenced. The Premier had the opportunity to attend that meeting, uh, along with the, the Minister for Women's I Issues and uh, Minister for Community and Social Services. Speaker, uh, my ministry, which uh, community, uh, community Safety and, uh, and Correctional Services, is also working very closely with the Attorney General's Office yeah. uh, on, on this in terms of uh, the joint Working group on violence against Aboriginal women um, and the FPT uh, working committee. Not to mention, there's about 1.4 million Thank dollars you. being invested in our communities to deal with sexual. Thank you. New question: The member from Balgonia, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, it's been one year since this House unanimously passed my motion to create an action plan on Lyme disease within a year. Lyme disease is a significant and growing health issue across our province. To date, the provincial government does not have a plan, adequate medical testing and treatment, and many health practitioners are not Lyme literate. Thousands of Ontarians are still suffering and seek medical attention outside the province and country. Minister, we all in this House gave people suffering from Lyme disease hope it's devastating to many that the Liberal Lyme Action Plan is all talk and no action. Health Canada predicts that there will be up to 18,000 cases of Lyme per year in Canada by 2020. Question. And Ontario currently has the highest number of cases in the country. Minister, it's been a year. When will this House Thank you. act? Where is the will of this House? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite and acknowledge that he has, uh, for quite some time, been a very strong and positive advocate for individuals uh, who are suffering from Lyme disease in this province. And uh, and I know he does know that the government is very committed, and I'm personally very committed to protecting the people of Ontario from Lyme disease. And in fact. We have an action plan, Mr. Speaker, but we've committed to updating that and strengthening that action plan. And what we've done, and the member knows this as well, is that uh, I believe in the summer, and I attended the group's first meeting, that we actually created a Lyme disease stakeholder group, which is comprised of many individuals who, in fact, have Lyme disease themselves or family members with Lyme disease or are strong and powerful advocates for people living with Lyme disease. Uh, and we've launched that group, that stakeholder group, Group to, in fact, Answer. lead our review of a Lyme disease uh, uh, action plan and educational process, and all those elements that the member opposite has rightly pointed out need to be done and strengthened. Thank Mr. you. Speaker.
the uh, it looks like we've got a few, so let's be patient and get this over. Here on Bruce. Order. Thank you very much. The privilege of freedom of speech is a very powerful tool in this legislature, Speaker, but it should never be used for political purposes. Earlier today, the Premier knowingly made an incorrect accusation about me, and I would. The, uh, the member also knows that uh, only members themselves can correct their own record. The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I see that in the member's east gallery, the mayor of Kenora is down visiting the Sunny South. Dave Canfield, welcome to Queen's Park. The, uh, I, think, I think the Minister of uh, Northern Development and Mines wants to get in on this, so I'm offering him the opportunity to do the same. Well, you're very kind, and thank you to the member of Perry South Muskoka, but it's just great to have the president of the Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association, Mara Kenora, and a great northerner with us today, so welcome again. Dave Campbell. Member from Scarborough, Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I believe we have a guest of mine from Scarborough Asian Court. Paige Aislinn Perry's parents, Don Perry and Jillian Hutchison, are here today. I want to welcome them to Queen's Park. Thank you. Lindsay Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. I'd just like to recognize my very good friend, Dave Canfield, the mayor of Kenora. He's over here in the West Valley. Thank you. We have with us today the mayor of Kenora. Welcome. We have a deferred vote and an amendment uh, to a motion for allocation of time on Bill 144, an act to implement budget measures and to enact uh, an, or amend certain other statutes. Call on the members. This will be a five minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? On November 25th, Mr. Bradley moved government notice of motion number 44. Ms. Jones then uh, moved an amendment to Mr. Bradley's motions as follows, that the paragraph starting, uh, starting the uh, Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs be authorized to meet, be struck out and replaced with, that the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs be authorized to meet on Wednesday, December the 2nd, 2015 from 9 a.m. to uh, dispense. No. Uh, to 10.15 a.m. and 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. and Thursday, December 3, 2015 from 9 a.m. to 10.15 uh, a.m. and from, 10, uh, from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. for the purpose of public hearings on the bill and that the clerk of the committee in consultation with the committee chair be authorized to arrange the following with regards to Bill 144. Dispense. 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 Is it the pleasure of the House? Uh, sorry. I'll get this right. All those in favor of Ms. Jones' amendment to the motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sound, Muskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Van Tuck. Mr. Van Tuck. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller, Hamilton, East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton, East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton, East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Monsieur Monta. Monsieur Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mrs. Sandals. Mrs. Sandals. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orizetti. Mr. Orizetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madam Lalonde. Madam Lalonde. Mr. Codrick. Mr. Codrick. Mr. Balkus. Mr. Balkus. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. The ayes are 36, the nays are 52. The ayes being 36 and the nays being 52, I declare the, amended, uh, the amendment lost. Are the members ready to vote on the main motion? Yes. Um, on November the 25th, Mr. Bradley moved government notice of motion number 44. Is it the president of the House the motion carry? Yes. I heard a no. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those in favor of post, please say nay. Yay! In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bell.
All members, please take their seats. Mr. Bradley has moved government notice uh, number f notice of motion number 44. All those in favor, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Mangat. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Swong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. 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 Mr. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pedapiece. Mr. Pedapiece. Mr. Chubisson. Mr. Chubisson. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Vantaugh. Mr. Vantaugh. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Montauk. Mr. Montauk. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 52, the nays are 36. The ayes being 52 and the nays being 36, I declare the motion carried. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.